Yuden Chronicles 100 Heroes is a game that, despite missing many marks, still manages to be highly entertaining. It's a very, very solid 6 out of 10. Now, before fans of the game get all in a twist, I run my scores on a true average system. That means I consider 100 Heroes to be above average. And you are going to see a lot of negatives in this review, but understand that it is coming from a place of love. Because I did greatly enjoy the game, but with a sequel on the distant horizon, someone has to tell this company that the game is not a 9 out of 10, but it could be. I want these issues fixed in the next game. I don't want to deter you from giving it a try, but to not point out these huge flaws would be doing myself, you, and the game a disservice. Okay, now allow me to explain myself. There's no question that the Suikoden franchise had a pretty large impact on the gaming industry. While it was not necessarily the first hero collector style game, as that prize goes to the Fire Emblem franchise, it was absolutely pivotal in expanding that genre of RPGs for better or for worse. It is, as far as I can recall, the only game in the genre that would lock you out of a true ending if you failed to collect all the characters. This is especially brutal since the games run 25 to 30 hours. The point is, I cannot emphasize enough that you need a guide to finish a Suikoden game in a single playthrough. And the same is 100% true for 100 Heroes. I myself have a full guide on how to collect every character in the game on this very channel, and if you plan on playing this great game, I highly recommend using it. 100 Heroes can run 30 to 50 plus hours, and unless you really want to replay it, you're gonna want that 120th hero on your first run, otherwise you miss out on the true ending. That's my first notch and complaint about the game. While yes, if you are thorough, you can absolutely finish the game in a single playthrough without a guide, it will take forever. As a very simple example, there's a character locked behind a series of cooking battles. Until you get pretty deep into that subplot, it may not even be obvious that you need to complete it. This is a series of 15 mini-games that are mostly uninteresting and not only take 3-5 minutes per attempt, but you can only do one every 10 minutes. That's real world minutes. And again, you have to do 15 of these things. That is 2.5 hours of real world time that you are waiting for them to become available, and then of course around half of that over again to do the actual battles. Not to mention if you aren't using a guide, it's pretty likely you're going to fail some or all of them at least once. And you may be thinking, well, you could just come back and do them when they are ready. But you have to really consider the logistics of that. There are more cooking battles in this game than there are dungeons. Meaning, even if you plan on doing one cooking battle per dungeon to break it up, by the end of the game you'll still be doing several consecutive cooking battles in a row, waiting for them to respawn. Assuming, of course, you have figured out that there's a character lock behind it and it's necessary. There's also a point of no return in the game which, once crossed, if you haven't gotten 119 of the heroes, number 120 will not be available anymore. It's an outdated and baffling design choice that these devs should have known better about by now. Some hardcore Suikoden fans probably love this feature, but they are a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the gaming community at large. The game has even more waiting beyond that. Your castle requires resources, and the nodes for said resources only respawn once every 5-10 to 10 minutes depending on the level of said resource, and usually only two of said nodes are available at any given time. Considering several characters are locked behind castle upgrades, this is another mechanic you can't ignore. This combined with constantly going back to towns you thought you had cleared, with only vague hints from the Sierra Bababa to guide you, well, as I said, use a guide. Time-gated gaming aside, the game has other problems related to its true ending. The Bigoma minigame comes to mind, and this one is baffling. There are two minigames you can regularly participate in. One of them is this super fun card game that I really enjoyed conceptually, but only were required to play it twice in the entire game. It's also a giant pain in the butt to get the second character for this game because you have to own 120 different cards in order for them to appear. Then there's the Begoma minigame, which I've gone into in depth during my character guides and the streams themselves, but the short version is it's unfun and you have to do it way too much. I honestly wish these minigames were reversed. Let monsters drop cards and make me play against card players all over the world and make Begoma mostly optional and let me buy tops from the shop. That's just my two cents though, and maybe a lot of people enjoyed the Big Oma minigame story. I've read Reddit posts and Steam reviews, they didn't. Graphically, the game is beautiful. It has some wonderful sprite work, some of the best I've seen. We're talking about Goku vs Superman on YouTube in 2011 beautiful. Some of the duels, which we'll get to later, have sprite work that would make Monty Ohm proud, rest in peace. Characters are expressive and the character portraits do them justice otherwise. I love Gar's goofy dog smile. Who's a good boy? The battles are clean and while some of the combo attacks leave something to be desired, others are an absolute spectacle. Overall though, nothing but praise for the game's visuals. Same with the game's audio. Every track in the game is a banger and you'll never find your ADHD riddled brain wanting for a different OST. Moving on to actual gameplay elements, we're again in kind of a sour territory. Everything in the game is both underdeveloped and overdeveloped at the same time. It's kind of a mess. The combat system has all these runes and characters, but a vast majority of them will never see the inside of a party. 
partly due to the fact that you don't get them until just before, in, or after the final dungeon, and partly due to them being so poorly statted in some cases they can't properly function without being severely overleveled. Leon and Ivy come to mind. Squishy frontline characters that deal no damage and have wonky stats. It's like these characters were afterthoughts and the devs let an AI develop them. There's also some pretty sick runes and ways to accommodate both of these characters and others, but you don't get them at a point where it makes sense. There's also an inventory limit system, which can be expanded various ways, but at the end of the day, this limit is there because the game's economy isn't properly balanced. Herbs cost next to nothing, as do most consumables, so instead of letting you hold up to 99, they just made it so your inventory has a cap. The only time inventory management like this is fun in the modern day is if it is itself a minigame. Resident Evil 4 Remake is a great example of fun inventory management. Signalis and 100 Heroes are bad examples. Another flaw with the game's systems is nothing is really skippable. If you know you're going to lose a big Goma match, you can't forfeit. You have to wait until the whole thing resolves. Same with the card game and cooking battles. And speaking of cooking battles again, there are a lot of animations that have to play out that also can't be skipped. So even if you're mashing A, it's still quite a bit of waiting. I actually damaged my A button a little bit with the amount of mashing I had to do in order to get through this game. The execution is pretty messy overall, but still strangely tolerable. Another underutilized mechanic and possibility is splitting the party. At around the halfway mark for the game, you have access to all three protagonists, which could lend itself to some super fun and interesting party split up sections, and the game does that once. Well, twice, technically. The first time you're going through a mostly empty dungeon with the possibility of two to three random encounters per party, and the second time is a boss gauntlet, which was incredibly fun to prepare for and execute on and made me realize that this was what I wanted from the game. Alas, those are the only two times you get to split the party and use more than a fraction of the entire cast in combat. It was a fun 20 minutes, though. Then there are the big wars, which were shown as a core mechanic of the game in advertising, but they are not that. There's honestly nothing to them, and in general, the big war set pieces are exactly that, set pieces. It's nearly impossible to lose a war when it's actually winnable at all. Several of the wars you auto-lose situations based on the story, and the rest of them you generally totally overpower your opponent. Much like Bigoma, there are tons of stats and abilities in play for these, but most of them are meaningless, as only the very last war has any sort of challenge involved. Again though, they are quite the spectacle for an observer, even if they are tedious for the player. The last mechanic that is sadly underutilized is the duel mechanic, which happens a few times throughout the game, and much like the wars, many of them are unwinnable. They're just spectacles to animate a 1v1 combat as more than just a turn-based battle. The first several of the game aren't winnable, though you survive long enough, you do get to see some cool sprite artwork. But at the end of the day, these are 50-50 guessing games that as far as I could tell were mostly determined by the player level. Damn, they're pretty though. The last thing is, of course, the story. The story is great for the most part. The core cast that gets the bulk of the dialogue is great, and occasionally a non-main character will chime in during cutscenes, but there are definitely some sections that felt rushed or incomplete, specifically the final dungeon. Then the game just kind of... ends? You beat the final boss, you have one last amazingly well choreographed duel, and then you're done. An amazing song plays, and there's an unvoiced acted escape sequence, and the game says good job! This is what happened for everyone. And that's it. After 50 to 60 hours of gameplay, I kind of expected more than a splash screen for every character, but that's pretty much the norm for a hero collector game like this, so it gets a pass just based on that. Overall, I loved playing through EC 100 Heroes. It is, despite its many flaws, a lot of fun, and I do recommend it to RPG enthusiasts. Just not before I would recommend Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, Unicorn Overlord, Shin Megami Tensei V, or any a number of other games. But if you are a hardcore turn-based enthusiast, you have likely already played those games, assuming you have access, and are probably looking for another great RPG, and this one is a good choice. It has a ton of room for growth and improvement, and I hope that in 100 Heroes 2, they really flex the muscle they developed during this game's four-year development cycle and knock it clean out of the park. I give Uden Chronicles 100 Heroes a 6 out of 10. It's a souffle that didn't survive its time in the oven and fell flat, but I mean, still pretty tasty. What are your thoughts? Be sure to let me know in the comments below, and like always, likes, comments, subscriptions help out, and it lets YouTube know you like these dives into video games, and speaking of which, I also have a new show podcast on this channel. Give it a try. Deuces, dummies.